Welcome back to Just Talking. We have a great show for you today. Why? We have an excellent dancer, choreographer, Rusty Frank. Rusty, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, let's hear about it. How did it, when did you start, decide to start dancing? When I was six, six right. years old. Yeah, I saw a Shirley Temple movie and like millions and millions of people before me, I caught the bug by watching watching her dance and those those old black and white movies that were just so wonderful to look at, like everything about them, the, the costuming, the set, the cars, the dancing, the, uh, everything. So I started and I grew up in Los Angeles. So uh, unbeknownst to my six-year-old self, I had access to some of the great legends in the world of tap. So I ended up just because he was the closest studio to my house, studying with a legend named Louis Dupron. And he is a famous, famous Hollywood choreographer. So kind of a behind the scenes person. So if anybody's ever seen Donald O'Connor dance, the guy from Singing in the Rain, you've seen my teacher because my teacher was his teacher. Wow. So I always say when you watch Donald O'Connor dance, you're really seeing the style of my teacher, Louis Dupron. What type of dances did you do back then to, to get started? Was it tap or? I was 100% tap. At the beginning, I, I was a little kitty. They used to have, and they still do, have these classes that are like, because of children's short attention span, it's like 10 minutes, tap, ballet, and tumbling. But tap was always it for me, just very clear. And so soon after, maybe one or two years later, I was only doing tap dancing. And I did tap dancing full on until 1996 when I saw Lindy Hop. And I was hired by a big Lindy Hop event here in the Los Angeles area. And uh, so they called Pasadena Ballroom Dance Association. And they had this huge Lindy Hop event and they invited me to teach tap at it. And I walked into this ballroom on Catalina Island and saw all over a thousand people swing dancing. And I, my jaw just dropped. It's like I had found my people. Wow. <laughs> because with tap dancing, people who stick with tap dancing, like a big, huge tap class is about six people because it's, it's so much harder than it looks that you might start with 20 people in a class in a 10 week series and within two weeks, it's down to five people. It's really hard. When you're in school, did you like perform in uh, competitions at all or just yeah. doing more you know, it's, it's interesting that you ask that. I was a closet tap dancer. Oh. Nobody knew that I tap danced at all until I went to college. And the reason for that was that tap had really gone out of favor in those years. It was considered corny and hokey and it was just this odd thing and it made me pull back again and just not tell anybody. So it wasn't until I went to good old UC Santa Cruz and they were doing musicals. So they were doing this 1930s musical and I auditioned and I was like, oh, I get to come out of the tap closet. <laughs> <laughs> right. And suddenly it was like cool and awesome and I was appreciated and I got a little starring. And that was the first time I had really performed I had done one musical, uh, a community theater production of Minnie's Boys, where I tap dance in that, but this was really the beginning of all that. So, yeah. Did you like performing on stage or uh, teaching? Or is there is one? Oh, I love performing. So I did a lot of, of musicals back when I lived up in the Bay Area. I did 42nd Street and uh -huh. Anything Goes and Babes in Arms and all those kind of 19 classic 30s and 20s musicals. And then... Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting ongoing story, but I'm also an environmentalist and human rights activist. So I always had this kind of side-by-side -side thing in where if you look at my scrapbooks, you'll see on one page, literally, will be me uh, going to some peace demonstration or human rights demonstration. And the other one is me in my top hat and tails performing. And then you turn the page and there I am at Save the Whales. And then, and again, top hat, and you know, it, it's just constantly. But what happened was eventually, as happens in life, whatever your wherever your your trajectory is it finally takes you so i was swimming between these two worlds and then finally uh, when i again when i saw this dancing so uh at this event i ended up partnering with one of the lindy hop teachers and moving to england and i moved there for two years and we did a cross trade where i taught him tap and he taught me lindy hop the swing dance and i ended up uh, having two years there performing and with him with the glenn miller orchestra which was incredible. We did a 51 city European tour as the featured dance act. So yeah, I've had a, just a fabulous experience. And when I came home, that's when I became a, a full-time dance instructor because I saw that unlike tap dancing, which I mentioned before, 
there's only uh, five, six people in a class. Lindy Hop swing dancing brings in 20, 30, 40 people in a class and you could make a living at it. So that's when I finally got to, to become a full-time 100% dance person, dance living person, making my living through dance. How's wow. that for a sentence? That's... Yeah, so that's been 20, like 25 years wow. as a dan full-time dancer, professional. For our viewers, the, the Lindy Hop, is you said it's somewhat like swing, or what, what exactly is Lindy Hop? Oh, yeah. So Lindy Hop is the original American swing dance. And okay. it, its birthplace was Harlem, New York. And it quickly spread like wildfire all across the United States and around the world. So it's, it's the original, original swing dance. It's an exciting social dance. And it... it uh, it, its popularity was all across the United States in the 30s and 40s, but during World War II, because of the GIs going overseas, it spread overseas too, but to a, an extent where when the GIs came home, though the swing dance became something else in those countries. Like in England, they have what's called jive, and in Germany, they have boogie woogie, and in Sweden, they have bug, like jitterbug. But then with the advent of YouTube, and virtual learning. Now you can swing dance any place in the world, I would say. I, uh, I have taught and or performed in 23 countries. And I just, I just did a birthday fundraiser on Facebook for a group of dancers, uh, young kid dancers in Uganda. There's a teacher there, a guy, a Ugandan there, or a kid George, and he's teaching kids in slums in Uganda how to swing dance because he thinks it lifts the quality of their life, so. Did you have your own dance partner, like Fred and Ginger? Was there Rusty? And I stuff? have. I have had several different dance partners oh, as well okay. as over the years. I've had many tap partners, and I've had many, several swing dance partners. So in, in England, I was with Simon Selman. And when I came back to America, Peter Flahiff and then Ron Campbell, Giovanni Quintero, Ted Stanley. You have a lot of it's. I haven't had one dance partner, but uh, I think one of the joyous things for me about dancing is dancing with somebody. I love it. Whether it's tap dancing where you're just side by side dancing together as a team or partner dancing. I just love it. I find that 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 social aspect of it, that of being with another person is really joyful. During even during these times when a lot of us have had to dance virtually over the computer, you know, we still do. And it it's any time I start moving and dancing, it just brings such joy to me. Maybe that's what leads to my next question is, if nobody has never danced before, what are the benefits of getting involved in dancing? Oh my goodness, what a great question. <laughs> so there's so many benefits. One is that, um, one is just it's great for your whole body, your health, your body health, because you're moving. And the other thing that many people don't know is it's great for your brain. They've done studies on the list of things that you can do to stave off dementia. And you know what is the very top of the list? The number one thing is learning dance. Oh. And they, I would love to see more in-depth studies, and I'm sure people are doing it. But there is something to do with while you're learning dance, not on, on, not only are you listening to music and learning steps, but you have to put that together. And they know that music lives on another part of the brain. I, you, you may or the, your viewers may have seen that examples of somebody who's like slumped over with dementia, they can't even speak, and then they'll put headsets on them and they prop up and start singing the song where they haven't spoken, maybe in a year or more. So they know that this music lives someplace else. And so these benefits are just great. And then if you can pick a social dance too, where you're with other people, then that, of course, they know the benefits of just being with other people. Even again, if this thing lasts longer, even virtually, it's great. So I have to, uh, I'll mention too, that many of my friends, some of my very best friends, most of my best friends are over 80 and really? in their nineties. Yeah. Last weekend uh -huh. I visited three of my best friends. One is 97, one is 93 and one is 94, all dancers. Now I believe you wrote a book. Uh, let's hear about that. <laughs> well, a little time step for you. Yes, there it is. F. Okay. Let's see. Now what's that all about? Okay. This was a really amazing project. I, I, uh, got inspired to write this book the day I read the obituary of my tap teacher, Louis Dupron. I was so like, upset, obviously, at his passing. And so just the, the thing that had struck me so much is that I would never hear his stories anymore. 
And then I started thinking, wow, nobody's going to hear his stories because he was never uh, prominently in front of the camera. So there, there are some clips of him, but all those great stories are all gone. And then I just had this epiphany that all of this genera that generation of dancers from the teens, 20s and 30s and 40s, they, this window was closing. They were all going to be passing on soon. And I said, somebody should write a book about these people. Then you have that moment where you go, no, it's going to be me. <laughs> so I did. I, it took three years and uh, there's 30 chapters and every chapter focuses on one person. And I interviewed all of them and it's all in their voice. And I picked people who had had their career as a tap dancer from 1900 to 1955 because that's the era. So it covers vaudeville, Broadway, movies, nightclubs. And I have super famous dancers like Shirley Temple, the Nicholas Brothers, um, Ann Miller. And then I have people that, you're, that the average person might not know because they were nightclub dancers or maybe never made it big in movies. But the beautiful thing about this era is that I think every single person in my book, you can now find a clip of them on YouTube. Oh, that's excellent. This is like really different times from when I was doing this. I did the book from 1988 to 1990, it came out. So there was no YouTube. There was not, no way for me to find you know, clips of these people unless I could find it on the TV and record it. <laughs> I think I read that there's a foreword uh, by Gregory Hines on the book. Yeah, what, what, Gregory. You, did you obviously met Gregory Hines? I had met, I had met and known Gregory over the years because he, he was very involved with the resurgence of tap dancing in the 80s. Oh, yeah. So he had made that movie Tap and also White Nights. That's and right. there were a lot of tap festivals during the 80s. And he was so supportive and he would show up to these festivals and teach master classes. So I knew him. And when I approached him about writing the forward, he readily said yes i would love to because these the dancers in this book were his mentors mm. they were his inspirations so his forward is just beautiful it's really beautiful yeah Good. and then gene kelly wrote the back jacket note but i have a funny story you want a funny story about gene kelly and donald yeah. o'connor i would love to sure. okay so donald o'connor had always ho hoped and dreamed to work with gene kelly in a movie and then when gene kelly approached him about singing in the rain he, he told me in the interview, he said, Gene Kelly was describing our characters and how we grew up together as little street urchins and we went to vaudeville together and then got into movies and we did everything together and everything alike. We jumped the same, we turned the same and all this. So Donald O'Connor was so excited and he went home and he said, oh my God, I only turn left. So he meant spinning. He only turned left. And he says, what if, which is common that dancers have a prominent turning side where they turn much better one way than the other. And he said, oh my God, what if Gene Kelly turns right? You know, most dancers turn right. So the next day he said he went to the studio and he sees Gene Kelly frantically running for him saying, I only turn left, I turn left. And so they ran to each other screaming, I turn left, I turn left. <laughs> I thought that was really you know, uh, a wonderful behind the scenes anecdote. Well, can people like order it on your website or on Amazon yeah. or is that? they can get it on if they get it on my website i'll i can autograph it for them which is Excellent. Excellent. yeah so my website is rusty's dance and chalk.com yeah, and maybe that's what we'll kind of close with where can people find more, some more information about you your website what's yeah. on the website that's it yeah so on my website um unfortunately right now we don't have any in-person classes but hopefully one day that can start again soon not in the but not until it's safe but um, I actually do have a lot of instructional videos available for, yeah, in my oh, shop. Right. So if people wanted to learn to tap or swing dance, they could through those. And then also uh, they, my book is available, my bio and um, right. all that kind of stuff. But I would just, I would like to actually say to your viewers that I, in my experience, in my life, dancing has really helped me through a lot of things. And you don't have to be a great dancer. It's just the experience of moving to music, either just by yourself or with people. It is super uplifting and can really, really, really help get your attitude on the right track. And so I wanna encourage people, you know, if you're feeling down, just get up and put your favorite song on and move around. Or if you're serious about learning a dance, do it and just give yourself the time and know that nobody's born a natural, natural born dancer. We all had to go through it. And I have proof on my website of me in my recital. I did one recital in my tutu 
So you can see that it actually took those 20,000, or was it 10,000 or 20,000 hours? And the uh, website one more time. Uh, Rusty's Dance oh. Chalk. Com. Sounds good. Well, Rusty, we appreciate you talking with us today. You're an excellent dancer and choreography, and definitely we'll check out your book. And thank you so much for talking with us today. And thank you. And everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and be joyful.